everybody and welcome. My name's Marnie and today we're going to be looking into America's most notorious serial killer, Ted Bundy. This is a case that I've been completely fascinated with for years and years since I found out about it. I think the case is just crazy. I think what he got away with was just incredible. I, it, I can't fathom it really. It's a really interesting case so I'm really excited to be talking about it today. Just before we start, I'd like to mention the case is really long and there's a lot of details, so I will have to cut some bits out. But if there's anything that I've glossed over or I haven't gone into enough detail in that you think is important to the case, feel free to comment down below because I'd love to hear about it and I'm sure that anybody else watching this video would also like to hear about it too. Today's video is likely to be quite long even though I have tried to cut it down a bit. So please grab a snack, grab a glass of wine, maybe order a takeaway and let's get into the case. Theodore Robert Bundy was born on November 24th, 1946 in Burlington, Vermont in the United States. He was a serial killer, rapist and one of the most notorious criminals of the late 20th century. He sexually assaulted and killed several young women in Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Utah and Florida between the years 1974 and 1978. Although he would ultimately confess to 28 murders, it is estimated that he was responsible for hundreds of deaths. Despite the appalling nature of his crimes, Bundy became something of a celebrity, particularly following his escape from custody in Colorado in 1977. During his trial, his charm and intelligence drew significant public attention. His case inspired a series of popular novels and films devoted to serial murder. It also galvanised female criminologists who contended that the popular media had transformed Bundy into a romantic figure. Ugh. Ted Bundy was born at the Elizabeth Lund Home for Unwed Mothers in Burlington, Vermont, to Eleanor Louise Cowell. While the identity of Ted Bundy's father is unknown, his birth certificate lists a Lloyd Marshall, although his mother would later tell of being seduced by a war veteran named Jack Worthington. Bundy's family did not believe this story and actually expressed suspicion about Eleanor's violent and abusive father, Samuel Cowell. To avoid social stigma though, Bundy's maternal grandparents claimed him as their son and Bundy grew up believing that his mother was actually his older sister. According to Bundy biographers, it is believed that he learned about the truth while he was in high school. However, true crime writer Anne Rule, who actually knew Bundy personally, believes that it was sometime around 1969, shortly after a traumatic breakup with one of his college girlfriends that Bundy found out the truth about his mother. The date that he found out wasn't really important here. What really stuck out to me is the sheer impact that information like this would have had. Whether he was a child in high school, whether he was in his early teens, late teens, early 20s, I just can't imagine waking up one day and just thinking that your older sister was actually your mother or that the person that you'd been calling mum wasn't your mum and actually was your grandma. I can't even imagine the impact that that could have had on what was going on in Ted's mind. Ted's mother later met Johnny Bundy and they had more children together. It is said that Johnny tried to include Ted in camping trips and other bonding activities, but that Ted remained isolated and didn't really want to connect with him. Ted's desire to be by himself increased and many believe that this possibly led to a later inability to socially interact comfortably with other people around him. Ted was shy and introverted through high school and his early college years. He would later say that he hit a wall in high school and was unable to understand social behaviour which stunted his social development. He maintained a facade of social activity, but in actual fact he had no sense of how to get along with other people, saying, I didn't know what made things tick. I didn't know what made people want to be friends. I didn't know what made people attractive to one another. I just didn't know what underlay social inattractions. Years later, on Florida's death row, Ted would describe a part of himself that, from a young age, was fascinated by images of sex and violence. In early prison years, he called this part of himself the entity. 
As a teen, he would look through libraries for detective magazines and books on crime, focusing particularly on sources that described violence and pictures of dead bodies. By the time Ted left high school, he was a compulsive liar and a thief. He was arrested twice as a juvenile, but these records were later expunged due to his age. In 1965, Ted began taking classes in psychology and oriental studies at the University of Pudget Sound. I don't think I've pronounced that properly, but it looks like Pudget? Pud... 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 It could be Pudget? I don't know. <laughs> After two semesters, he transferred to Seattle's University of Washington. During university, Ted did not hold any one job for more than a few months, and although he was never caught stealing, he had been regarded with some suspicion by employers. Ted's psychopathic nature was being revealed, but most of the people that witnessed it didn't realise what they were experiencing. Stealing without any sense of guilt, and in fact, with a sense of entitlement, are common traits of a psychopath. Ted started what is thought to be his first relationship with a university student in 1967. This relationship ended after her 98 graduation, and she decided to return back to her family in California. It is said that she was fed up with Bundy's immaturity and lack of ambition. After the breakup, Ted dropped out of college and travelled east. It is then that many believe he finally uncovered the truth about his parentage. After this discovery, Ted became a more focused and dominant person. He re-enrolled at UW, this time with a major in psychology. He became an honours student and was well liked by his professors. In 1969, he started dating Elizabeth Kloepfer. Kloepfer? Klopfer, maybe? Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth was a divorce secretary with a daughter, and she fell deeply in love with Ted. In fact, they dated for more than six years, right up until the point when Ted was imprisoned in 1976. So I'm just going to divert from the timeline quickly, just to discuss the movie. Extremely wicked, shockingly evil, and vile. I'm sure you've probably heard about this movie. I think it came out around 2019. It stars Zac Efron as Ted Bundy and Lily Collins as Elizabeth. If you haven't seen the movie already, it is based on the book called The Phantom Prince, My Life with Ted Bundy, which is actually written by Elizabeth. And they are both very authentic to the true story from Elizabeth's perspective. <laughs> I do recommend watching the movie, but I would highlight that it is from Elizabeth's perspective. As someone who was deeply in love with Ted and possibly didn't believe that he did a lot of the stuff that he did, um, a lot of those parts are missed out or glossed over. So it's not really a fully informed movie in that sense. I do, however, think it's very interesting to see things from her perspective. I watched the movie after watching the Ted Bundy tapes. Um, I think it just kind of worked out that way because the Ted Bundy tapes came out on Netflix, I think the year before, and then the movie came out a year later and I would recommend watching them in that order. So you kind of have all of the facts um, before you watch the movie because it does miss out a lot of those crucial parts. That's my cat. <laughs> Let me let the cat in. Hello, hello. Oh, hello. Hello, hello. No, 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 no. Ted graduated in 1972 and in 73 he enrolled in the law school at the University of Puget Sound. He did poorly. He dropped out in 74, around the same time that young women began to disappear in the Pacific Northwest area. There is no definitive agreement on when and where Ted's murders began. Some believe that he could have started as far back as his early teens. This was because in 61, when Ted was 14 years old, an eight-year-old girl vanished from her home. Ted always denied killing her, but the suspicions were always there. The day before his execution, Ted told his lawyer that he made his first attempt to kidnap in 69 and implied his first murder was in 72. A psychiatrist who interviewed Ted said that he claimed to have killed two women while staying with his family in Philadelphia in 69. In his death row confessions, Ted said that he committed his first murder in 72, and in 73, one of Ted's friends saw a pair of handcuffs in the back seat of Ted's car, which indicated that he was probably doing something around this time. For many years, Ted was a suspect in a December 73 murder of a woman called Kathy Devine in Washington State. 
However, later DNA analysis led to another suspect who was actually convicted in 2002. The earliest known and identified murders by Ted Bundy were committed in 74. This was when he was 27 years old. In the next part, I'm going to talk quite explicitly about the murders that Ted committed. The events that follow depict extreme violence to women and graphic detail. So if you feel that you may be adversely affected in any way, please click off from this video and hopefully I will see you in the next one. If you are leaving us now, thank you for watching up until this point and I will be doing some cases that aren't so graphic, I promise. Shortly after midnight, on January 4th, 74, Bundy entered the basement bedroom of an 18-year-old dancer and student at 2W. He bludgeoned her with a metal rod from her bed frame while she slept, and then sexually assaulted her. She was found the next morning by her roommates, lying in a pool of her own blood. She was in a coma for 10 days following the incident, but I'm happy to say that she did survive the attack. Bundy's next victim was another UW student, and actually his cousin's roommate. In the early morning of February 1st, Bundy broke into the victim's room, knocked her unconscious, dressed her in jeans and a shirt, wrapped her in a bedsheet and carried her away. Young female college students began disappearing at a rate of roughly one per month. On March the 2nd, Donna Gail Manson, a 19-year-old student at the Evergreen State College, was kidnapped and murdered. On April 17th, Susan Rancourt disappeared from the campus of Central Washington State College. Later, two different students would recount meeting a man with his arm in a sling. One that night, and one three nights earlier, who asked their help to carry a load of books to his Volkswagen Beetle. Next, Kathy Parks, who was last seen on the campus of Oregon State University on May 6th. Brenda Ball, the first victim, who wasn't a college student, was never seen again after leaving the Flame Tavern on June 1st. Bundy then murdered George Ann Hawkins, a student at UW. In the early morning of June 11th, she walked through an alley from her boyfriend's dormitory residence to her sorority house and was never seen again. Witnesses later reported seeing a man with a leg car struggling to carry a briefcase in the area. One student reported that the man had asked her to help her carry the briefcase to his car. His car was a beetle. Bundy's Washington killing spree culminated on June 14th with the daytime abduction of Janice Ott and Denise Nusland from Lake Sammamish State Park. That day, eight different people told police about a handsome young man with his left arm in a sling who called himself Ted. Five of them were women who Ted had asked to help unload a sailboat from his beetle. One of them even went as far as to going up to the car with Ted, where they found no sailboat, which then prompted them not to accompany him any further. Three more witnesses testified to seeing him approach Janice with the story and to seeing her walk away from the beach in his company. She was never seen alive again and Denise disappeared four hours later. So up to this point, detectives now had a description of the suspect and the car, and soon flyers were put up all over Seattle. After seeing the police sketch and the description of the suspect, Bundy's girlfriend, one of his psychology professors at UW, and a former co-worker all reported him as a possible suspect. Now this part really frustrates me, because if the next part hadn't have happened, so many women could have been saved if he'd have been stopped at this point. Despite the fact that three different people had reported him to the police as a possible suspect, at this time the police were receiving upwards of 200 tips per day and they noted that a clean-cut law student with no criminal record, seemingly educated, seemingly a nice guy, didn't fit the profile that they were looking for for the person that was committing these crimes, so they ignored the tip and didn't investigate him. It's frustrating. It's really frustrating. That autumn, Bundy moved to Salt Lake City to attend the University of Utah Law School. On September 2nd, while on his way there, he picked up a hitchhiker in Idaho, sexually assaulted her and strangled her to death. 
she was never found. Nancy Wilcock also disappeared from Utah on October 2nd and was last seen riding in a Volkswagen Beetle. On October 18th, Bundy murdered Melissa Smith, the 17-year-old daughter of Midvale Police Chief Lewis Smith. He sexually assaulted, sodomized, and strangled her. Her body was found nine days later, and post-mortem examinations showed that she was kept alive at least five days after her kidnapping. Next was Laura Amy, also 17, who disappeared when she left a Halloween party on October 31st. Her body was found naked, beaten and strangled nearly a month later by hitchhikers on Thanksgiving Day. On October 18th, Ted Bundy approached Carol Durant, claiming to be Officer Roseland of the Murray Police Department. He told her this story that someone had tried to break into her car and then asked that she accompany him to the police station. Carol followed him and got into his car and they drove for a short while until Bundy pulled into the hard shoulder and attempted to handcuff her. During the struggle, Bundy pulled a crowbar out from behind his seat, but Carol caught it just before it struck her skull. She then managed to pull the door open and escape the car. About an hour later, a man showed up at Viewmont High School, 19 miles away from where the incident had happened in Murray. This man approached a teacher and a student, asking both of them, separately, to come out into the parking lot and identify a car. They both declined. The teacher then saw him later on, breathing hard, his hair was messy and his shirt was untucked. Debbie Kent, a 17-year-old student at the school who had left to go and pick up her younger brother, was never seen again. Investigators later found a small key in the parking lot outside of the school. The key matched the handcuffs taken off of Carol de Ronch, and this allowed the police to link the two events to the same suspect. In 1975, Bundy shifted his crimes to Colorado. On January 12th, Carolyn Campbell disappeared from her vacation with her fiancé and his children. Her body was found four days later. Next, ski instructor Julie Cunningham disappeared on March 15th and Denise Oliverson on April 6th. Back in Washington, investigators were using computers to cross-check different lists of suspects against each other. So what this meant was basically they would look at different lists that were relevant to the case. So they might look at classmates of some of the victims and then owners of Volkswagen Beetles and then looking at the two different lists they would then cross-check to see which names came up more than once or on more than one list and they were hoping this would help them to narrow down the search um, and the list of suspects because they literally had no idea who was doing this. Bundy was one of 25 people who turned up on four different lists and his case was second on the to be investigated pile. On August 16th, 1975, Bundy was arrested for failure to stop for a police officer. A search of his car revealed a ski mask, another mask made from pantyhose, a crowbar, handcuffs, trash bags, a coil of cope, an ice pick, and other items that were thought by the police to be burglary items. He remained calm under questioning, explaining that he needed the mask for skiing, and he found the handcuffs in a dumpster. Utah detective Jerry Thompson connected Bundy and the car to the missing girls in the area and searched his apartment. There, they found a guide to Colorado ski resorts, a check mark by the Wildwood Inn where Karen Campbell disappeared, and a brochure advertising Viewmont High School where Debbie Kent disappeared. As a result, Bundy was brought in for a lineup before Durant and other witnesses. He was identified as Officer Roseland and the man lurking around the night that Debbie Kent disappeared. After a week-long trial, Bundy was convicted of kidnapping on March 1st, 1976, and sentenced to 15 years in Utah State Prison. On June 7th, 1977, in preparation for Karen Campbell's murder trial, Bundy was taken to Pitkin County Courthouse in Aspen. During the court's recess, he was permitted a visit to the courthouse's law library, where he jumped out of the building from the second story window and escaped. He made it all the way to the top of the mountain without detection, where he rested for two days in an abandoned cabin. On June 13th, he then tried to steal a car that he found on the mountain and drove back into Aspen, attempting to leave. Luckily, two police deputies noticed the car weaving in and out of its lane, and after pulling Bundy over, they recognised who he was and took him back to jail. But... <laughs> 
this is a long story, so it doesn't end there. Back in custody, Bundy started working on a new escape plan. He managed to acquire a hacksaw blade and $500 in cash. And over the next two weeks, he spent his time sawing through a small metal plate in the ceiling. And after spending weeks dieting and starving himself, he lost enough weight that he could fit through the small hole and access the crawl space above. On the night of December 30th, 1977, he packed books and files under his blanket to make it look like he was sleeping, crawled up into the ceiling, dropped down into an empty room and just walked out the door. The jail officers didn't notice he was gone until noon on December 31st, so basically a whole day later, and by this time he was already in Chicago, so chances of finding him, he gone. <laughs> In Florida, Tallahassee, Bundy rented a room in a boarding house under the alias of Chris Hagen and committed numerous petty crimes, including shoplifting, purse snatching and auto theft. He grew a moustache and drew a fake mole on his cheek when he went out, but other than that, made no real attempt at disguising himself. In the early hours of January 15th, 78, two and a half years of repressed homicidal violence erupted. Bundy entered the Florida State University Chi Omega Sorority House around 3am and killed two sleeping women, Lisa Levy and Margaret Bowman. He bludgeoned and strangled both women and sexually assaulted Lisa. He also bludgeoned and severely injured two other Chi Omegas, Karen Chandler and Kathy Kleiner. It took no longer than half an hour, which means that he spent just over seven minutes on each victim. On his way home, Bundy broke into another home just a few blocks away, clubbing and severely injuring Florida State University student Cheryl Thomas, as if the four women before just weren't enough for him. On February 9th, Bundy abducted, sexually assaulted and murdered 12-year-old Kimberly Leach. On the 12th, he stole another Volkswagen Beetle, I don't really know what this guy's thing is with Volkswagen Beetles, but he seems to love them. So <laughs> he stole another one and left the area for good. On February 15th, he was stopped by a Pensacola police officer after the officer ran the plates on the Beetle and the plates came back as stolen. Bundy was arrested, but he refused to tell the officer his name or who he was because obviously he had warrants out for his arrest and multiple charges of murder. He was booked in at the local police station and positive fingerprint identification was made early the next day. So he was immediately transported back to Tallahassee and charged with the Che Omega murders on top of the trials that he was already awaiting. Ted Bundy went to trial for the Che Omega murders in June 79. Despite having five court-appointed lawyers, he was cocky and overconfident and instead managed to convince the judge that he should be in charge of his defence, despite the fact that he seemed incompetent and irrational. There were two crucial pieces of evidence in this trial. First, a Che Omega member identified Bundy in court as the man that she saw leaving the house on the night that the murders happened. The second piece of evidence was related to his teeth. During the murders, Bundy had bitten Lisa in her left buttock, leaving obvious bite marks. Bundy had a really unique bite. His teeth were kind of crooked, so police took plaster casts of his teeth and forensic experts were able to match them to the photographs of Lisa Levy's wounds. At the end of this trial, Bundy was convicted of all counts and sentenced to death. In a second trial in the 80s, Bundy was convicted of the murder of Kimberly Leach. Evidence found in his van matched Kimberly's clothing and eyewitness statements placed him and Kimberly together. He was sentenced to death again. Bundy did not take any of these trials seriously. He smirked and argued for outdoor exercise, a different menu and access to the library, which is not normally given to people that are standing trial for anything, let alone, you know, multiple murders. He turned up to court in a bow tie and even proposed to one of his friends while he was questioning her on the stand. The trial became a pantomime conducted by an entitled narcissist who cracked jokes and everybody laughed as if they weren't there because he murdered people. Bundy's arrogance and entitlement is hard to stomach and hard to accept, 
But I think the reaction is even worse. The fact is, the media at the time lapped up his behaviour and loved the dramatics that he brought to the courtroom. Most chillingly, in the judge's final address, he said to Bundy, You are a bright young man. I don't have animosity to you. It's just disgusting. It's so grotesque. FBI profiler Robert K. Ressler, who met with Bundy as part of his work interviewing serial killers, said, This guy was an animal, and it amazed me that the media seemed unable to understand that. Shortly before his execution, Bundy confessed to eight official unsolved murders in Washington state. Former King County homicide detective Bob Keppel later described Bundy as the kind of man who was born to kill. He described the crime scene and it was almost like he was just there, like he was seeing everything. He was infatuated with the idea because he spent so much time there. He is just totally consumed with murder all of the time. Bundy was executed in the electric chair on January 24th, 1989. Several hundred people gathered outside of the prison and cheered when they heard the signal that Bundy had officially been declared dead. Bundy had a consistent pattern. He would approach a potential victim in public place and use various methods to gain their trust. Sometimes this would mean that he faked an injury and just asked for their help doing something. And sometimes this meant that he impersonated an authority figure to gain their trust. He had a remarkable advantage in that his facial features were attractive, but not particularly distinctive or memorable. In later years, he would often be described as chameleon-like, in a way that he was able to look totally different by making only minor adjustments to his face and the rest of his appearance. All of his victims were white females, and most were of middle-class background. Almost all were between the ages of 15 to 25, and many were college students. Most of his victims had long straight hair that they parted in the middle, which was just like the woman that Bundy first dated. It is speculated that Bundy's resentment towards his first girlfriend was a motivating factor in his string of murders. However, in a 1980 interview, Bundy dismissed the hypothesis. They just fit the general criteria of being young and attractive. Too many people have bought this crap that all the girls were similar, hair about the same colour, parted in the middle, but if you look at it, almost everything was dissimilar. They were almost all different. The killings followed a pattern too. After luring victims to his car, Bundy would hit her in the head with a crowbar that he placed either underneath or inside his car. Every skull recovered except one showed signs of blunt force trauma, and every body except one showed signs of strangulation. On death row, Bundy confessed to visiting his victims' bodies over and over at their dump site. He would lie with them for hours, applying makeup to their corpses and sexually assaulting their decomposing bodies. This case fascinates me because people seem to have heavily romanticised Bundy's character and persona just because he doesn't fit the ideal image of a stereotypical serial killer. We are primed from childhood in the books that we read and in the Disney films that we watch to expect monsters to be ugly. But you'd think that by adulthood, it wouldn't surprise us that good-looking people can inflict great harm and can be terrible people. Why don't we want to believe that beautiful people can do terrible things? In 2019, Twitter users flooded the social media platform with comments of Bundy's hotness. But it's not just Twitter users. Bundy's looks blinded people at the time too. He received fan mail during his trial and young women would turn up to see him. Structures of power and the hierarchy of our society allow people like Bundy to literally get away with murder. Because surely, a good-looking, white, well-dressed and educated man can't be guilty. <laughs> we have seen it time and time again. This tragic and disturbing story is a stark reminder that women need to be more aware of their surroundings and more cautious. Unfortunately, things like this still happen today, more than 50 years later. Ted Bundy had victims as young as 12 years old who never got to live up to their full potential. Most of the women that he murdered were in college or high school. Women whose lives, opportunities and talents were robbed from the world. So, to end this video, I'd just like to spare a thought for the 30 known women and girls murdered by Ted Bundy and the dozens of other women 
who may never get justice. That is all for today, you guys. Please share your thoughts and comments in the comments box below. I would love to hear what you think about the case. Or if you like, you can let me know of any cases that you'd like me to cover in the future in any of my next videos. Remember to wash your hands, drink lots of water, and do your skincare routine every single day. Okay, I will see you in the next one.